Good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to just ramble on and do a little bit of housekeeping uh, while we wait for everybody to come in. Um, I'm Jess Loveland. Welcome to this, another BFI Network webinar. Um, if you haven't joined us for one of these events before, I'll just talk through a few things that might make your experience a bit more fun and interactive. Um, on your Zoom screen, you'll see that we've got a chat box. I'm going to be lurking in there. You can talk to each other. Uh, you can talk to me. I'll drop any links and things that come up through the course of conversation in there so you can check them out. Um, please set your settings to all panellists and attendees so that everyone can see what you're talking about and not just the panellists. Um, there's also a Q&A box. You can drop some questions in there that you'd like to ask um, Ted a bit later on. Uh, please do feel free to fully engage there. Um, you can keep questions anonymous if you'd like to. Um, anything else before I disappear? So I'm going I'm to go and lurk in the chat box now. But first of all, I want to introduce you to your moderator. Um, this is writer, director and good friend of BFI Network, Mr. Benjamin B. Um, ben has projects in development at the moment with the BFI and BBC Studios, and he's made a series of really brilliant short films, including Metroland with BFI Network, Mordecai and Step Right Up. So I'm going to hand you over to Ben now. Good afternoon, Ben. How are you? Hi, I'm good in these strange times. Um, I'm going to keep it really brief. Um, I'm going to introduce Ted, which I don't think he really needs an introduction, but he's getting one anyway. Uh, Ted is a veteran of the film, in, well, of the independent, I'd say, American world cinema of the 90s, uh, founding Good Machine, well, the indie powerhouse going on to then This Is That. He has genuinely made some of my favorite films, which I'm gonna mention now, which is Todd Solon's Happiness. And a film that I don't think gets enough recognition again and again, so I'm just gonna mention it. If you haven't seen it, go see it, American Splendor. It is, a, in my opinion, probably the greatest com comic book movie. Um, and then, yeah, Wedding Bank Bank Banquet and Ice Storm, which were cultural events, I would say. When I was young, Ice Storm was a thing. Uh, I'm going to hand you over to Ted. Well, we'll say hello to Ted. Uh, and I'm going to start with one very simple question, which is, Ted, you've lived through 9-11, the financial crisis of 2008, and now COVID, and, and also other things that happened this year, really, really great things like Black Lives Matter movement. And I'm going to ask you, how come you are so positive when everybody else is terrified? <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> I, you know, like I, I'd even go back to that. You know, maybe it's like having uh, a ample dose of chaos in one's uh, family life growing up, you know, whether that's like, you know, s single parent or like uh, having the privilege of, uh, get uh, living in the town where the hell's angels would would summer you know <laughs> so you got a you got a you got a kind of unique uh dose of cultural influence from that but uh i think you know it actually probably begins with something that i, I i'm sure you know all you know early filmmakers uh experience you know you spent your life so far trying to find the things that you love, that you care about, that you want to devote your your labor, your knowledge, you know, your, your time to, and it feels like you may never get to do that, right? I had no connections. Um, I knew my family didn't really want me to pursue this path. Um, it felt so far beyond my 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 grasp. You know, um, but I really wanted to reach for it, you know, um, and I didn't believe it was going to happen. And then you start to be able to take stock at some good fortune things that you have, like meet just simply meeting good people, chance encounters, and that sense of discovery when you find that film that feels like it speaks to you. And somehow their situation was a little bit like yours, and they got it made, right? Because 100% like what, as you go along in your career, what you start to realize, to me, like the perfect analogy of getting movies made is running headlong into a cement wall without a he helmet, right? And somehow believing that this time it's going to open up and let you through, right? And you keep doing it and you're broken and bloody and bruised. And then lo and behold, one day you're on the other side of that wall. And, you know, and it's, 
it's hard to fully understand everything that had to align to get that to happen. To me, like when you hit a, when you see a huge disaster, you know, um, like, you know, you know, both, all of these uh, uh, disasters, as opposed to this, the positive social movements that might have come from a history of neglect, you know, and systematic prejudice, that the, the disasters also come from sheer arrogance, uh, uh, neglect, um, same sort of things. They did not have to happen. We could have had a better way of handling it. And my outlook is that every time that you look at something when you have the best and the brightest totally fuck up, right? It shows that there's real opportunity for folks who have also fucked up several times in their lives. I've made mistakes. I went in the wrong direction, you know? But damn it, if, if all the top uh, movie companies in the world could invest in Jeffrey Katzenberg and Meg Whitman's bad idea of Quibi and lose billions of dollars in the process for something no one ever needed or, or to my degree, indicated they wanted, hey, hopefully they'll, uh, somebody can make a chance of putting a few million into that uh, daring movie that might actually uh, shift where culture goes, right? And I think that, that that same time is like, yeah, they don't, you know, how do I describe types of movies I've made my entire life? When I first, uh, you know, in concept, very few people wanna talk about them, right? When there's a script, they don't wanna read them. When we're going out to cast, they don't wanna be in them. Right when when we're trying to get the financing, they don't want to give you money. When you're trying to get into the festival, they don't want to uh, give it give it a place. Right, but once it's gone through that, they're kind of shamed into their uh, behavior, their past behavior, to recognize they have to support it and they have to change the way that they do things. I was really helped um, early on in my career you know, uh, by two different organizations, one being Film 4 in the UK and the other being American Playhouse in the US, where both of the heads, David Aukin and Lindsay Law, you know, said to me at different points in time, yeah, we don't really like these movies, but we actually get where you're going. And we think that people will respond. And I think that so many times you have to have, you have to find those people that have that conviction to say like, I can take stock of where we are, but I don't wanna be here. And I'm gonna figure out a way to help move us in another direction. Like when I see things like what Yorgos Latimos and Athena Sangari, you know, uh, help do with the Greek new wave to kind of say like, okay, our state funds are going here and we don't like that. And we wanna do something that speaks with, with real ambition and form and content to a much younger audience than our traditional art house audience is here. And we're gonna push it there. And lo and behold, everyone says, hey, you know, that's what we wanted all along, right? You know, uh, and I think that that's generally my outlook is that we've all been trained and tuned now more than ever before to, to actually settle for what we get not to demand what we actually want or like, right? And it takes what is the artistic community and the, their fans, art, artists, audiences to say, you know, we're, we're fed up. We've had it up to here and we're not gonna take them anymore. We want something else. The gifts that I've had in my career come directly from the fact that uh, once I recognize that those groups, AAA, move, move faster than the business or the marketplace, and thus the cultural institutions, right? And that if you hitch your wagon to where, where they, they're thinking, and you can speak that other side's language, you can start to shift culture there. And that's what we're seeing now in the positive social movements of Black Lives Matter, and, and, and overall inclusion, empowerment, and, and, and diversity, right? That because it's aligning 
with a, a change in how we do business, right? It's a, it's coming right as the the the, the main um, you know filmmaking industry kind of moves from a, a theatrical single title revenue driven business model to a uh, for better, better for worse, we can talk about that. I'm a huge advocate for theatrical immersive experience, but the business is moving, you know, to to uh, streaming, which isn't a revenue based, single title revenue based business. It's an attention based portfolio business. Its business goals are customer acquisition, right, and customer uh, retention. It's a much different model. And it's going to yield some different ways that people have to work and some things that they have to produce. But the key thing is that industry, the, the digital uh, you know, wor world, uh, recognized the old industry, the, the studio theatrical driven worlds, you know, uh, fa falling, falling asleep you know, at the table, right? That the, the studio theatrical world thought that because you know they couldn't you know uh, hold on to the creators of the IP, the 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 filmmakers or the uh, actors as they did in you know decades past, right? That if they simply had the superior amounts, the bigger piles of cash, and a better the best way to physically distribute titles around the globe. They, they, they could maintain their stranglehold on power, but they were asleep. And the digital companies, the Fing companies, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, and Google, you know, uh, amassed tons more cash, so much money that they could buy a studio at, at you know, a drop of a hat, right? And they had a better way to distribute goods digitally, right? So they lapped the studios and then also, lo and behold, they had something the studios never achieved and always needed and never drove towards, even though they had plenty of canaries in the coal mine to remind them of that. And that is a direct relationship with the audience, with the customers into their homes, you know, what the internet provides. And through that, they could actually get to know them a lot better. And that's where that breakthrough is going to be the biggest cultural change. Because you know, you sit in the, the luxury of your own home and you turn on your, your, your streaming device and you see what a hundred years of cinema has brought us. You know, a ton of ton of movies and shows generally, you know, that that are uh, made or starring folks that look like you and I, Benjamin, right? White dudes, right? And that's not what the customer looks like, right? Because the, the companies now actually have access to see who their customers are. And we're shifting, right? That's no longer at all the majority, this, right? And they're going, if they want to grow their customers, which is what their business is, they're going to have to wake up and uh, diversify what their content is in terms of the uh, both who's in the in the films and shows and who makes the shows they have to change the perspective tremendously. And one of the things that gets me super excited, right, is anytime I think we've seen new groups and classes making art, right, we see a huge leap, right, both in terms of where th that the innovation of a form takes place, right. In, term, in terms of what the audience tastes are. And I think like we're gonna see a real pivot, right? You know, like two years ago or a year ago even, I maybe knew, you know, three people who had watched a non-English language television series. Now everyone I know has, right? Everyone I know has. And that, you know, that change is going to keep on coming, keep on coming. So when I, when I look at, you know, the, the situation we're in, I, 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 I'm reminded that for thir I, someone posted a, a crew photo of me from 35 years ago. So I know uh, they did last weekend on Facebook. So I definitely know I've been in the business 35 years. And every single year, someone has said, it's over. 
indie film is dead. I've said that a few times. Um, like this change is bigger than we've ever had before. But I think truly this year, 2020, this time it's for real, right? This time the change is a total shit storm. And yes, some great things are gonna be lost for temporarily in the process, right? That's going to happen. But we actually know now that many great things have been lost for 120 years because they've been denied, right? They, had, they didn't get their shot, right? And now we're going to get to a place where more folks of different backgrounds and uh, experiences are going to get their shot. And that's gonna move things in a much different way. Um, so yeah, I can't help, help but be hopeful. Like I, 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 and I hope that when uh, the bad things happen, cause we could walk through what those bad things might be. When those bad things happen, uh, we're, we're, we're quick to act on what we want to preserve, recognizing that we can't always make the right choice in the moment, you know, so we're going to have to be able to go back and look at it before things get lost. But we, we, we will uh, express, you know, where, where our love and devotion lies. And at the same, same time, rejoice in this unique change that we're going to get to live through. That, yeah. That all sounds completely fantastic. I completely miss something off getting excited about films. Of course, your five and a half years as the co-head of Amazon, um, yeah, Amazon Films is incredibly important. And the book, which Jesse can maybe put a link to in the, um, yeah, you've got to there, Hope for Film, which is genuinely one of the best books about film. It's, it, as, as it just, it's really exciting and really brings you to life. So I think it's important to talk about because there's a lot of producers that'll be listening and, and thinking about the old model of like how how you got films financed when you started at Good Machine and how that's changing from what you're saying now that it's not really money that people are after but like eyeballs you people to watch what's happening um what is the worst case scenario that you that you're talking about there with the idea of yeah distribution and obviously oh. releases um Look, the, the, the film business has always had a really big hurdle to, to um, surmount in that just to get someone to go see a movie, right, requires them to have a behavior change, right, to break their routine, right? Like, I, I'm a big believer that both to, like, stay optimistic, find calm, um, and to, to, to see new ways of combining things that are meaningful to a lot of people, right? Which I think we all struggle to do those things as artists and entrepreneurs. Um, it's super helpful to try to break everything down into a series of components, right? And try to, try to name those and recognize where they are. You don't have to judge those, but you want to see where, where, where they are. And, determine what matters most to, to you. I'll come back to that uh, later. But one of those is like, okay, so what is it to actually go to see the movie, go to see a movie, right? We, we don't go to see a movie until our desire exceeds our recognized inconvenience and cost, right? So um, the, the history of getting into a movie theater required a form of marketing that was like constant impressions, keeping something in the top of your mind until that kind of place where you say, wait a second, you know, I, I do this in the morning, this during the day, this in the evening, I wanna uh, have these four nights to be with my family and friends and these two nights to, to with, with my romance. Boy, I only get one night uh, a week to see movies. Maybe I should make sure I fall in love with somebody who likes movies as much as I do. Um, you know, it, it, it's a it's a challenge to try to figure out like, do, you know, am I going to spend the money for the babysitter, the parking, the gas, the ticket, the dinner, all of these things. But the film business thrived despite all of that inconvenience, right? Well, now we've just cemented another piece in that behavior, right? That everybody is staying in their house, you know, watching the, you know, uh, not just the telly, like 
the, the great thing, the film business died for, for years with people watching what was up on the, the tube because so much sucked, right? <laughs> you know? But now that we have access to tons of great stuff, we don't have that. And you develop that further routine. And everybody, you know, you know, our, our governments and society have done such a good job making us fearful in so many ways about, you know, terrorism or, or competition or people who don't look like we, we do, as opposed to leaning into the, the, the real, the truth, which is we are actually super friendly, compassionate people who want to make things better, right? Not everyone may agree with me on that, but I think you've just been, you know, fed, fed the blue pill. Um, the, the, uh, um, the, the, uh, now that we have pandemic on top of that, you know, there's a huge, another huge uh, barrier to, uh, to getting out in the theaters. The business structure of the theater business, what, you know, they weren't planning to like, what if we have to take a, a year long break? A lot of those companies are gonna go out of business, right? And they're all built, let's be real too, movie theaters, were built for a style of going to see the movies that that blossomed a hundred years ago, right? They're not based on how we live now and the things that we value now. They could be. When I was at Amazon, I always wanted Amazon to buy movie theaters. And I wrote out a plan that had some like 86 different ways that we could innovate movie theaters based on how we actually live today. It's like our cities. Like I love London. I love New York but they are built for ways people lived, you know, a hundred plus years ago, right? So the theater is going out of business. With those theaters that go out of business will be all the mid-range distributors that also are the ones that take um, risks on more adventuresome movies, right? They're going, a lot of those distributors are gonna go out of business in the US, you know, which would account for like half of a film's uh, film sales and the rest of the world, right? Because those, so those territorial distributors, those mid-range US distributors out of business, international sales business, um, which sold to those, just lost all their clients. A lot of those are going to go out of business, right? The, 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 both the, the national film boards that would, would be able to fund, you know, 30, 40% of a movie and trust that regional film sales could drive the balance along with bank financing or the US private equity sources that did the same sort of thing. That model doesn't work anymore, right? They're gonna have to find a new model uh, to do, do that. So all of a sudden, all of us who have relied on that model are going to lose that as something in our toolkit. Now it's not gonna happen overnight, right? I would argue you probably have because change takes so damn long. You probably have about seven years where some films, not as many as they used to, but some films will be able to take advantage of that. Like, look, I, um, when I joined Amazon, I thought we had a two year runway before there'd be intense competition in the global streaming world, right? It was, but it was just us and Netflix for five years, right? And now there are six or seven, of those companies, they all are US centric and they all are English language dominant, right? But that obviously, obviously will have to change, right? And we should have another four or five suppliers on the global basis. But that's 10 big companies that all need to finance films for new audiences, not for library content, but for new audiences in authentic ways. And they all kind of, that, like the common sense logic, if you're trying to get new customers, before, before I went to Amazon, I worked at a company called Fandor, which was a small streaming service. And, you know, uh, got to learn some of the basics. And if you really wanna build your audience, you wanna drop a new title every week that you push forward to them. So that's 50 titles minimum on the film side 
across 10 companies, right? 500, uh, right? Five, five, 500 films that are going to be needed. And that's the minimal number, right? So let, I'm sorry, every time I do a hand gesture now, um, I don't know if, if any of you have seen that video uh, online with somebody uh, laid in an accordion into Donald Trump's hands. So like every time he talks like this, he's making squeak. I can't unsee that. Now I'm like, oh my God, I see that in my, uh, but uh, so I'm gonna keep my hands below the camera. Um, the, uh, you know, five, so, you know, 500 f films, that's probably more like 800 films that are going to want to be fully financed, you know, um, and they're going to have a much different agenda in who tells those stories and who stars in those stories than ever before. And they will soon by their third or fourth year no longer want to be uh, focused solely on the language of their origin. So they'll move into other languages, you know, so th there's going to be a huge demand for, for you know, uh, local language production all over the, the world. Um, so uh, I forget where all that got, got to, but all, all I'm saying is like, you see, you see that shift occurring right now. That's what we're living through in the midst of the, the pandemic. And uh, if I, as a film lover, all of a sudden realized like I had access to movies from around all the world uh, in a frictionless way, you know, all I would need to do is find someone who wanted to sit on the couch with me so I don't feel quite so alone and watching these movies every night instead of going to movie theaters. So that that's a hard rub. So now the 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 uh, the, the film theater is going to have to up their game and really give a much better experience. It might mean a higher price point. It might mean a combination of live events. It certainly will mean better food and drink at all the movie theaters. So, okay, so thinking about that, there's new producers that are listening and there's, they're obviously like, how they're gonna ask the same question, which is how starting from nothing, can you break it, break into the stream, like into like, yeah, the top six American based streamers? Like, how is that gonna be possible? Cause it seems like that's just a little caveat question. It seems like what bigger producers seem to want to do is pip directors and writers from lower budget movies and then take them up, leaving the producers to just starve because they're not making enough money on these smaller budget movies. Yeah, yeah, thing, th things have to change. Like I, uh, I, I was super fortunate, you know, to kind of start trying to do this in the early eighties. I had a super low footprint. You know, if I could get a slice of pizza and a generic beer, you know, every night for dinner, I was still pretty happy because I was living on my own. I was no longer in the small town. I was in the big city. I, that carried me for at least five years. Um, but I was also arrived, I also arrived at the moment, many other people who had the same wishes. So it was, I wasn't alone. I was part of a scene, right? And I was fortunate to, to be there in kind of what was the 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 second wave let's let, let's say of of punk rock the first wave of kind of graffiti uh, street culture art in the galleries and kind of a, a feeling that people were finally recognizing you didn't actually need all the formal training you didn't have to uh, you know uh, know how to do everything as long as you really brought a lot of personality and attitude to it. And you weren't, uh, you didn't, you didn't buy into this uh, idea uh, of genius or heroes or individual accomplishment as the sole uh, motor of success. Like everything I've experienced, it's through collaboration. It's being part of a community. It's generosity and compassion for what your fellow people folks who are trying to do it are that's what's lifted everybody up so to, to me you know i think the, the first que question the first answer to that question is really make sure you find the good people you know and provide for them as well as you provide 
almost for yourself, right? You know, like look out for them, not at your own expense, but look out for them and carry them with, with you. And, you know, know that you all have failings. You're going to drop the ball sometimes. You're going to forget to update somebody. Look, I just did that with one last night with one of my collaborators. We had a super intense call uh, with, with uh, on a project, and I didn't call one of my producers right uh, that I was partners with after it to update them. My bad, right? You know, like we all make those mistakes, even after 35 years. I, you know, I I wanted to watch the debate. I didn't call him. And then I wanted to watch Errol Morris's My Psychedelic Love Story after that. So unfortunately, I neglected him. But um, I'm going to solve that, hopefully. Um, that that uh, the big goal, like you have to ask yourself what your core driving question is, you know, when you start out, what is it that you want? And I, to me, I think most people in the film business, that question comes down to, how do I have a sustainable creative life or a sustainable and generative creative life or a sustainable and generative creative life doing the things that I love or, you know, making good things even better. Or, you know, they, they'll find the thing that fits for, for them. And then that process, there's a process, I think, where you want to kind of work backwards. You want to make sure that you're going to feel better about what you're doing 15 years from now than you do today, right? That I really believe that everyone in the film business entered it because of love of cinema, because they saw what they could do and the, the, the delight that unique storytelling brought to them. But if you've been working for even a year in the film business, it starts to feel a whole lot different than that. So how did all these really well-meaning people become so angry or mean or ugly or you know just like narcissistic egotistical misanthropic malcontents liars cheats and thieves right how did we get there and that's on a good day right i think that's the the hunter s thompson line of some sort um, about the music business um you know you have to ask yourself how to prevent that happening to you and I think it's really kind of easy, right? Like you want to decide what really matters to you, where your values are, and you want to make sure that you have folks who can help dull the pain, you know, when you've had that tough day of constant rejection because you're running against a brick wall without a helmet, right? That, that eventually you're going to start to really carry each other forward, right? And I would also encourage, you know, unless you know that you're going to be making the thing that everybody loves all the time, you want to make sure that what your practice is as a filmmaker, as a producer or director, you know, isn't just project related, right? But also looks towards the ecosystem. You know, how are you going to continue to build for, for the long term? How do you keep it evolving so that more people uh, can, can enter and participate and uh, the language keeps advancing, you know, and the stuff that you love, which for me is, you know, really, you know, ambitiously authored vo voices of a very distinct variety, how can they thrive in a better way? Um, and eventually I think you start to find enough people that you can get that flywheel going, that something uh, uh, strong starts to happen. You know, I think I, if I had answered that question briefly, I would say just like the key is to plan for the long term and then figure out what that really means. So you don't want to just have a project, right? Look, we all have to launch and find that way to get moving. But if you're able, when you have that uh, first project to also have your second script, all the better. And if that means you actually have to partner with somebody so that you're able to t capture the momentum from one film to move to the next, all the better, right? Um, and you know, you and you really see this in this movement to the attention economy-based, you know, uh, 
entertainment industrial complex um, that single films mean less than uh, films that can kind of link to each other, that can carry the experience uh, of watching into the next. How do, you care, how do you help people migrate from one to the next, to the next, to the next? And there's many answers to that question. You know, it's all still being explored. But um, I think the, the final thing I would add to that is that everybody that's here today participating, recognizing they're relatively, you know, new, new to the field is in the driver's seat, right? Because this change that's occurred, uh, you understand better than the gatekeepers will ever understand because this is your life and you've been living it, right? So you have to, this just happened, you know, 2020, you know, the, the worst year in the history of our lives, you know, is also the year, you know, as I said, that the, the shift of power moves from cinema, from studios and theatrical to global streamers. Um, but it just happened, right? That competition that we talked about, increased number of companies, that's this year, right? It's only this year that Amazon, the number two company, um, the one that I worked with, released its first film on a global simultaneous release that we had generated as a script, you know, supervised as a production, and then provided sufficient marketing money uh, behind so it could engage with a global audience, right? And the thing that's kind of remarkable about that is that previously the only films that had a global release were tent poles and franchises and family films, and they would spend ton and ton of money. A global simultaneous release is now open to all genres, right? Um, all story uh, concepts, all filmmakers. And part of that global simultaneous release, which is a brand new phenomenon, is also how one might uh, engage with that audience, right? How do you harness the, 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 the reaction? And that's through social media more than anything else. And even though social media is like 10 years deep in people's lives, we still don't know, people still don't know how to transform, you know, what is that, that, that equation that the internet now allows for, right? What is, what is filmmaking today? It used to be two legs of a triangle and now it's fully closed, right? It's how we convert our leisure time into, you know, when, and then we watch a movie and that's, it becomes intellectual capital. We, we, we have now had a new experience and we share it with others. That's social capital, right? And the internet connects that, connects that. And that again can be an amplification system, right? And nobody's a master of it. All those that have grown up as digital natives understand it a whole lot better by their experience. They've lived it, right? The people that are currently empowered don't get that fully yet. They don't know how to do it. There's going to be big change over these next five years and lots of experimenting. And that's a really good thing and a really good place to be if you have something unique and distinct and you have the faith that you know how to reach your community with it. So then the question that nobody, I, I, I haven't seen the answer to is then how are independent filmmakers gonna gauge success? Because you don't have the access to the information. Nobody's quite sure if Netflix, what next figures mean, because it's like clicks and mint, like if they've watched seven minutes of a series or a thing, it's counted as a view and then, so how is anybody outside of like Netflix or Amazon or any of the, you know, the big six gonna gauge success? Um, excellent question. And, and it speaks a lot of uh, where we are, right? I'm depending on Europe, Asia and Lat Latin America, the governments and the people to pass laws that say, those that generate data have a ownership stake in that data, that it doesn't just go to the, the, the platform itself, right? So that's not gonna happen in the States. I have no faith that's gonna happen in the States. But I do believe that that can happen internationally 
where, where you as the originator of the IP have some sort of uh, continued shared stake in the data that your work generates. But, I, but in the uh, current side, it's also really worth noting that what that means when you don't have access to, the reason they don't wanna give you access to the data is because their business is customer acquisition and many of these companies' business is not just selling entertainment subscriptions, but they, they're, they're unlocking the utility that cinema has inherent within it to drive those customers to other buying activity, right? AT&T, Amazon, Apple, they have bigger things to sell you than an entertainment subscription, right? So if, if they gave you the data of every new user you brought to the platform, you might have a right to part of that lifetime value um, of that customer. So it, it's against their business interests to share that. So what happens to performance-based bonuses, which was precisely the, the logic of so much was that we will give you a reward inherent to your risk, right? You, you fund a movie, you will be able to get profits, right? You only now have that first sale of it. But I think that in some ways, since the, 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 uh, this era we're living in um, values the new much more than it values the long tail, that there's a real possibility if folks actually organize to do so, to claw back some of those rights um, and provide that to the, 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 um, own, the creators of the IP and those that, that uh, take a risk on them at an early stage. Um, the, the, uh, the other thing that you want to start to recognize and figure out how do you game is that uh, generally speaking as a filmmaker, you're, not, you're rarely paid on the work that you've done. You're paid on the expectation of your work to come, right? So you want to try to figure out how, you know, either, you know, how to make work on a consistent basis so that you can follow, you know, your fees can, can be based upon that. Or you need to find out, you know, how you're going to survive in between those gigs if you're somebody who works at a different cadence than constant, right? Um, and, and, and use that. But I think there's gonna be a, a kind of huge change of foot. Um, there, there are some things that I, I don't fully feel comfortable speaking about now, but I think are logical outcomes of that system when people wake up. The, the simple thing to approach would be, you know, like I do have some plans on a new company um, and new ways of working. And when I've pitched it to, you know, uh, folks I've worked with my entire life, uh, the producer, Ann Carey, or the producer, Christine Vachon, they say, Ted, you've been pitching me this idea for over 30 years, right? Which is essentially just like, what do I want? I want a global producers cooperative. That's what I wanted with Good Machine way back in 1990, you know, but I actually think now you can actually build it that we actually have become very good at managing complexity, right? Like we have systems in place that help us work in a collaborative, cooperative nature better than we've ever had before. And it's time we actually use that to generate the, the art and business of, from the things that we love. Spot on, and you've answered one of the questions that's coming as well. I'm gonna jump in some questions. <laughs> And this one right. is from Sasha Santiago. And basically the question is, in this new virtual world, do you believe there's a sustainable future for hyper-local micro-budget stories made and funded by communities it serves um, and distributed through smaller regions, nevertheless still discoverable by global audiences focused on the needing uh, to go out to global, uh, to go out to be global to be successful? Yeah. I, I, I do, and I also want to give much more thought to, thought to it, but it, I, I, you know, I, I love quiet, small, hyper-personal, hyper, -personal, hyper uh, 
you you know um, specific tales. Like I kind of feel the more specific you are, the more universal you often are. Um, but th there's problems within the 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 emerging ecosystem for how that work can can both launch and then resonate outwards. And um, you know basically. Uh, because this, the next two years will be primarily from a business perspective defined by this uh, rush to sign new customers. They, they will lean, all of those platforms will lean to more mainstream, low hanging fruit, you know, uh, high concept, star driven uh, stuff. But you can't make 50, $100 million movies in a given year, right? They have to find uh, types of titles that are more efficient, that are made for low cost, but actually may not get the, the, ton, the, the huge numbers of new subscribers. But you know that within that specificity, anyone who's in that demographic will want to sign up and join, right? Now, that won't be a single film. You can't just make one. Like when I went to Amazon, because the reality was we needed to diversify that platform right now, right then, I, I was able to get Spike Lee's Chirac made, but they didn't stay with it. We only had one film that we made at that point that addressed an African-American audience specifically. And you need 10 to keep people uh, you know, engaged on a regular basis, right? So if you're doing a, a low budget, uh, hyper localized, small footprint film, my first advice would be to, to find nine other filmmakers who want to do precise, precise, precisely that and try to band together into something like what Yorgos and Athena did in Greece, right? Um, that that uh, also, you should be open to the idea that maybe the traditional uh, sequencing of media is not the right way to do it for your work, right? Um, that, that the sale may be more to the global streaming platform, but that may be a shorter lifespan and maybe they'll cooperate with you and maybe they won't, but how you want to make sure that that affinity group that you're trying to address is able to have a ownership stake in that work, you know, so from the beginning, how is that, how are you going to do that? Um, and I think there are answers to it. And I think that there is room for experimentation. And I think there's lost a lot of vested bodies that will recognize that, but it takes a level of organization that is beyond just, I, I wanna get my movie made quickly. You know, so it will depend on producers and executives that uh, can look at the big picture across the length of time, as opposed to just saying, get it done fast. You know, that I, I, I think that this era really will require a far greater amount of cooperation amongst creators and their uh, communities than we've ever had before. Like we really, as an industry, and I would say as a planet, you know, kind of have to start to, to build some long-term plans. We need to map out, you know, our roadmap to utopia. You know, how do we, what do we really want and how do we get there? And that has to be a kind of process that gets result, you know, revised every year. Um, happy to talk about that more, but uh, yeah, I've got a lot of questions, so I'm just gonna come yeah. through into another one. Um, so we have, so yeah, it's a difficult one to talk about. How does this new, uh, new evolving model affect film budgets for independent film at the moment? So, yeah, so what's what's the state? Well, of the yeah. I, I think it's, it, it's true for uh, filmmakers who um, have been able to uh, defer some of the, the most people's goals of um, 
you know, it might be education and the huge amount of debt that that brings on if they don't have a government that actually believes that popul population should be educated. It might mean family and, you know, uh, delaying uh, having one and certainly property ownership uh, too, that all those things will become real uh, barriers to, to get, uh, getting things made. But in the States, you know, one of the um, things that's kept the film industry vibrant is that, you know, independent film is the crime that they allow you to commit over and over again, right? How does an independent film get made? It's by exploiting yourself and your family and friends, you know, that, that people aren't paid a living wage. They're not guaranteed all, all of the things that, I, that life should uh, provide. And they take a huge amount of risk around a few folks to get those things, those careers launched. Um, that because of where we are in these uh, intense streaming competition, I'm trying to wean myself from saying streaming wars, uh, someone called me out on it. I think they were totally right to do that. We shouldn't use that language. That's not what it is. But it's intense uh, business uh, competition. Um, that there will be higher value than the price point it takes to make a ambitiously authored work of a small footprint, right? So it, it, particularly, I think, if filmmakers are working in a kind of high concept realm, but on a low budget, that uh, there's a pretty good chance that if you have uh, a modicum of, of, of talent and voice, uh, you can make something that is going to be valued at a higher price point than it took to make it, right? And it's akin to, like, when I started out, the, the big gift was the brilliant minds of the industry had not developed any pattern recognition skill for the for future casting for the world that was to come so when they made movies they licensed music for movies and television right so in the era i first uh, came of age professionally many films could never go on the video store shelf because they didn't anticipate future technologies and that led to a boom in low budget filmmaking right to precisely have stuff to go on the video store shelf because the, the geniuses that were in charge did not anticipate uh, new mediums, right? In that uh, same sort of way, you know, we don't have a supply uh, of affordable movies that address the audience needs um, on a, to, to supply that huge demand of new content the global streamers will have. So, the one realm that I think uh, offers a relative safety, I think, would be high concept, you know, films, uh, genre films, well e executed. When we were at Amazon, at when I was at Amazon this last year, we finally got to do something that I had tried. I once had approved and then shot down, and we did a little bit of it. But I, 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 I would love to be able to uh, do a sustained effort of low budget films that have high concepts. So there were four films that Amazon uh, released this year that uh, folks should, should look at as models. Um, uh, the Vast of Night, Sella and the Spades, um, and uh, you, you just on mute there, there so Benjamin. I, I, loved the vast, I loved The Vast of Space. I thought it was like, I just thought it was like a brilliant small movie with so the high concept worked perfectly. I really, yeah. really loved and, it. And, and, all, and in these films, you don't need to have recognizable stars in if the concept is strong. Blow the Man Down, kind of like a feminist Coen brother, early Coen brothers uh, film, and, and uh, Get Duped. You know, some films were, were more bold than others, um, but they were all high concept films executed well that ultimately you look at and you say that they, they, they're authored, they're authored works, only that filmmaker, and they all worked very well for the platform. And I think films like that provide an entryway where the risk is still the kind of risk that, you know, 
you can put together in a small group, let's say, say no more than a million dollar uh, budget and ideally half that amount. And the, the, clearly they demonstrated uh, their value more than twice that amount um, on the platforms, sometimes significantly more. Um, so that's one way to, to go about it, right? At, you know, at the same time, that there uh, is this huge need for uh, diversifying what the content and their creators are. If you want that opportunity, you have to prove yourself first. That's the challenge. So whether that's uh, consistent short films um, or my, uh, micro budget film, you know, trying to get to that next stage. The challenge is we still do a really poor job uh, of recognizing everybody's potential and not just basing it on what we've seen before. You, you make a micro budget film, people want to classify you as a micro budget filmmaker. You know, how do you not get into that, that trap? And I think some of it is really one of the things they want to reward you for is consistency and cadence. So you want to be able to show that you are somebody that has a regular output of things. I don't even think it has to be the same thing, but you want to be able to show that you are generative, uh, you know, because the thing, you know, as we talked about, you're often compensated for your, your future, yet here's a problem where people can't see your potential. They only want to pay you for your experience, right? You have to constantly be shifting. And what you want to create, you know, is ultimately fear that your next piece of work is going to be even better than the one that you did before, right? And they only will, will have that if they know you're going to get stuff done on a regular basis. Like, you know, I think of different kind of cooperative models, like, uh, you know, the last 10 years, like in the States, you had the Safety brothers who, like, through Red Bucket Films were turning out shorts, you know, on a regular basis and features and, you know, it was like, these guys are making new stuff all the time. And, you know, now they're masters, right? They, they've kind of hit that level. And I, I was fortunate enough to be able to work with a uh, group of guys, um, Josh Mond, uh, 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 Sean Durkin, and um, Antonio Campus, who called themselves Borderline. And they were three directors who were like, we're going to work together till each of us has directed at least one feature along the line. And I think that really served them to help launch in that uh, cooperative nature. And again, I think like, you know, looking at what uh, uh, Yorgos and uh, Athena did in Greece also, like models like that, that you have to, you have to instill the sense that you have a regular output and the best thing is still yet to come. So there's a question from Andy Mark Simpson, who I know is a director, and he says, um, so how important do you think it is for filmmakers to cultivate their own audiences? Um, and does that help prove it to funders and I say to even streamers now, if you can prove that you already have an audience with what you've been making and what you're doing? I love that question because I had so much faith in that as a business model 10 years ago. And I have to say some of that faith has, uh, you know, become leaks and puddles on the floor. Um, the, but I still think it's very important. Like I got very excited when I came across Kevin Kelly's 10,000 fans idea and very excited when I came across uh, the long tail and very excited when I came across uh, DIY uh, artist, uh, entrepreneur uh, activity and very excited when I got um, exposed to cross-platform transmedia storytelling. I felt all those things could really work in unison to allow somebody who had a very specific style of work to maintain a adequate standard of living in producing that work for that audience. The, the force of well-capitalized corporations um, on one hand has held that back and then just people's tendency to, 
you know, not only like what they get, but to most covet what the other people like, as opposed to being in a place where we actually trust our own uh, taste and passion uh, as the verifying, you know, aspect of, of engagement. Um, however, you do the math and it absolutely still can work, right? It just hasn't become like I, the, you know, I have great hopes for the niches on a grand scale that you could have all these different affinity groups, you know, um, that were devoted to that diet and uh, you could start to supply them along those lines. You see it at the highest level, right? That Billie Eilish, you know, on um, her first album is able to sell her home movie documentary, you know, for 20, whatever it was, $5 million to Apple, I think. Um, and there's a correspondence to how many Instagram fans she had at that time, 25 million, you know. And meanwhile, uh, well proven acts that have had longevity and committed fan bases at much smaller amounts, like the Beatles, uh, you know, don't have their work, you know, going for that same uh, price point, you know. Um, but there's no doubt that that has real value, you know, and it's why you still see celebrities, you know, launching Instagram accounts and face, you know, and, and other social media accounts. Um, I think as a artist, uh, you're going to benefit creatively for having an authentic relationship with the people that love your work most. So I really do encourage people to go after it, not just from a business point of view, but for what it will do both for your emotional life, but also uh, for your creative life by, by spending some time in developing that. Like I, you know, Amanda Palmer, musician, you know, who, who works off label and uh, is very supportive of her community and they're super supportive of them doesn't have anyone that mirrors her in the movie and film space. And there should be, right? Folks who, who, who wanna show that, that I think it's totally viable. Um, but you're going to be still a pioneer and we've had 10 years of waiting for you to come. So good luck with that. <laughs> it's great. I'm wary of time. It's now for you 36 minutes past uh, nine. So I don't know what time you need to be away, but um, I'm going to keep going until you call quit on it. I've got uh -oh. another question. Um, just enjoying myself. So we've got another question um, from a producer called Maria Kuana Galizia. And I have to be honest, I work with Maria. So um, she's incredibly talented, I will say. Um, she says, hi, Ted. I wonder if you have an, an opinion on why British indie features don't seem to be traveling very well at the moment and any advice you'd give to producers who want to make non-studio uh, films uh, with an inter with international appeal but i think i'd just add that would be maybe this is the time as well i said i would ask the question is what your opinion of uk british cinema is at this current juncture going into it you know it, it's it's funny a lot of the movies that gave me faith um, early on in my career were British independents, you know, whether that was seeing something like Beautiful Laundrette or Wish You Were Here or, um, you know, uh, Pavel Pawlikowski's movies or like so many other films that I uh, encountered were super inspiring, as were like the earlier stage of non-studio authored cinema that came out of the U UK. Um, so, you know, my perception is it absolutely can work, but I see the, the barriers that, that are there. Um, and some of that, I think, comes that, that more in the States, it, you know, it's probably uh, UK and France that people actually have a perception of what a nat national film culture might be, you know. And of course, like the, the British one is either like uh, kitchen sink social realism or stiff upper lip period uh, pieces, you know, uh, along the, the way. And people 
how do you counteract that? You know, you know that doesn't necessarily apply to you. Um, how do you make people still want to engage on a global basis? Um, I think, you know, I've always felt that what I made were, was international films with an American accent, right? Um, and I think there's a lot of opportunity in that where, where there can be a great amount of fluidity of language, of location and setting, and, um, you know, uh, dialogue with uh, past cinema history that, uh, doesn't need to be so limited in prior expectations. Um, you would think that um, things would resonate a lot more uh, in the States, you know, with, with UK culture. I'm really eager to see Steve McQueen's Small Axe series and uh, resisted. Like personally, I, I'm loving this uh, COVID era film festival stuff. Not not versus the old world of being with people and seeing things on a big screen, but I'm loving the access I have to global cinema. You know, uh, via the film festivals that you can watch in your living room, right? Um, but I resisted watching Steve's films when they were available uh, to first to stream in that way because I was like, I love that idea of doing a anthology of films uh, for a streaming environment. And I'd like to see them in the sequence that they would design it. So I decided to wait for the sequence to have that unique experience. But I do wonder, you know, uh, how that's going to uh, re relate uh, stateside, you know, to it. But again, for me, like I, I've always found the more specific a title is to a time and a place and an experience, the more universal it is. There are things that are hard to address because they hit so close to home. Like I, I was fortunate enough to be uh, a little bit involved in Alfonso Caron's E tu Mama Tambien. And I don't think American audiences that saw it could have embraced it if it had been in the English language, because American audiences are really Puritan. You know that 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 was a movie that you know sex what was a, a big part of what the story and discovery was, and they needed the distance. You know that 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 movie afforded them by being in a different language than their native tongue. Um, so I, I'm hoping that you know look. There's, there's no secret that America has a huge problem uh, addressing its racist past, you know, and, and learning how to move move through it. So I'm hoping that with those films, we'll be able to look at them and have enough distance to actually confront the deeper problems that ex ex that exist in our uh, culture. Because the fact is, I do believe we can transcend those, you know. Uh, but it's not going to. It hasn't been easy. Um, I I I I, I, w I w wish I, you know like to to me, I, I I would just always encourage people to be you know super specific and authentic to the uh, to the what the story demands are uh, in telling it, and to recognize that as an individual, you're not going to be able to do that on your own. And no matter whether you're from the culture or working outside of the culture, you better have a lot of people that have stakes that are in it. You know, to me, like every story you want to treat as sci-fi and understand that people don't understand the, the, the rules of engagement, what it is to live in that time and place. And that's what your effort is as a storyteller. So if you think you have an expertise just from your own experience, you're being a little short-sighted. So you want to bring in a, a good team of collaborators to help sh make sure that you've, you know, interrogated your work to make sure that it is truly authentic in one way or the other. So you touched upon, you talked about festivals and how you've been watching them digitally. Um, I just think this is a really, it's the question that everybody's asking. For your career, obviously Sundance was hugely important. And I think, are you still like 
one of them, if not the most successful uh, um, producer, winning yeah. Sundance Grand Prize. Anyway, so what do you see going forward? And do you see, this is the thing that I always wonder, festival buzz, social media, and how long it takes a movie that could win at Cannes to finally get to say where I live in Newcastle, in there's like, there's now two independent cin cinemas. To, for me to see it like a year later when that buzz has died off and the new buzz is there, like, what what do you see? What what what? Yeah, on the horizon. Well, I, I I think that we have to move. Like we're always concerned about the launch, right? And we're not concerned about the life cycle. And we have to kind of give more focus to what that life cycle is, because we are living in this era of superabundance, where the you know tsunami, the herd of elephants of the new crush the long tail uh, uh, of everything. And we see that in the States right now where they're, particularly in the documentary world, th there's a plethora of really great films that did not get to complete their sales cycle because of when the pandemic hit. So films that debuted last year at Sundance that you know would have sold in a normal world or one, what was once a normal world, you know, are still available and new titles are coming online on a regular basis, right? So there's a super big challenge there. Um, and there's no doubt that like, you know, if you had to say what were the kind of two differences of streaming and, and theatrical in terms of uh, audience receptivity is that, Theatrical, uh, you can afford to be challenging, right? That a, a movie like Parasite, particularly for in English speaking or US based audiences is a challenging film. And I believe that because of the format that people had, they loved it in, in that experience, but they couldn't leave. They were immersed and they could feel how, what that common emotional, uh, response was in strangers, you know, within the, the room that was theatrical, where streaming is much more a comfort food, right? It's a, you're also distracted when you're there. And it's really easy if you don't get jolted to jump to the next one, uh, very, you know, very on, like people don't have the same level of commitment. So, uh, the type of movies that, that uh, I love, it's really hard for me to think about those films that, that are willing to challenge the status quo and earn their appreciation as opposed to deliver it to you like right away. The films that are much more the experiment than the proof, you know, where people are reaching beyond their, their, their grasp to try to add to the conversation in a way that they didn't have necessarily planned, but the engineering of serendipity has thus delivered something even greater, i.e. art. That's really hard, I think, to deliver in a streaming environment. You know, I felt that when I first encountered Transparent on Amazon, like I was, I, I thought that season one was in without a doubt, the best independent film of the year. Um, and uh, I was like, wow. And that gave me real hope for what streaming could deliver. But as abundance and opportunity increase, I think uh, the home viewing audience's patience level also decreases in a level of correspondence. So theatrical festival group, immersive screenings, what we once called film festivals, are really a, nece a necessary part of the, uh, of the structure. But I also think we, we've relied on them so much because they were efficient and established, they were what we were used to getting, that we didn't do the work on how we can actually stage build um, anticipation and desire, how we can prime an audience, the, the, the core affinity group in the, uh, along the way 
so that we can reach that similar flashpoint that then creates the inciting marketing event that makes people want to engage. And I think that there is real opportunity to do a kind of staggered release schedule that relies a little bit on what was this velvet rope barrier that you know festivals provided that the cognoscenti, the, the self-selecting film lovers, you know, uh, got to taste it first and deliver what was the proof of concept that like, yes, they dig it. They were called film critics. But is there another way that through carefully selected um, and self-selected deep appreciation of affinity groups might get to try on and start to amplify in a different way. You know, I don't really know like what I would do with, with challenging filmmakers, you know, who are actually the, the outliers that, are, that push the conversation forward, that, that, that really are the ones doing the experiment, but with a desire to entertain and engage, um, how they're going to be able to have a uh, the 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 appreciation that they deserve and the impact that their work deserves. But I can tell you this: I'm going to do everything I can to make sure it to be true. And I want to find others that feel that way. That's the work that I love most that I want to celebrate. And I believe that we can come up with new things. But I think it, it does take both those in the business and those that are in, in the art to actually let down the, the fucking arrogance that we all have and think we know best. And now we have to take some big risks, fall on our face, make some mistakes and learn how to do it better, fail better, fail better. So that, that just, I'll finish with one last question from, and I apologize if I pronounce this incorrectly, Esther Afomadu, which is talking about, um, talking about this looking for high concept, low budget, or these exciting new films. How does a producer ensure that they collaborate with the right kind of script writer or the right kind of person to match the mark? So I guess it's a question about collaboration because throughout your entire career, like if it's Ang Lee walking in and saying, I'm gonna die if I don't make a film, and, or, you know, anybody else, Hal Hartley taking you on that trip to go and say, we're doing this, we've got a tiny bit of money to do that. How do you know, because you've got to hold that passion as a producer from the beginning, right past when the, the director goes insane and starts saying that everything's going wrong to then finishing the edit and people coming in and saying things and get it right out. You've got to keep, yeah, keep that passion. You're the only person that really has to keep that passion. Yeah. To, yeah well, I, I think what, you're actually hitting upon and uh, is reflected actually like in the questions and in so many things. Like I look at what's in the Q and A and I know th these names. I know who some of these people are because of social media, right? That they, they've engaged, they're passionate. I'm with slowly developing a relationship over time, you know, uh, through engagement. And, um, and that is like every, you know, film film is ultimately a relationship, right? You're trying to find a common language. You're trying to make sure that you you have a, a similar agenda and goal, and that you really know each other. You see each other. My job as a producer is to be able to feel like I'm inside my filmmaker's mind, right? But we think about like how this goes on, and it's like high speed online dating or, or something where people are supposed to spend five minutes together and be together, you know, to, you know, for, for a long term. You're making a movie. It's safe to assume that's a five year relationship that you're going to need. Yeah, right? no matter how quick it starts, like it's gonna go on for at least five years. And you're hoping, since you're not going to be adequate quickly compensated for it, that you're building for the future. So it's not just this one film, it goes longer, right? So I think the first bit of thing, before you were talking about making movies, we have to get to know each other, right? We have to show the respect of that relationship. 
And I think there's lots of improvements that can be done to develop commonly accepted best practices of how you develop a, a collaborative relationship, right? I find it super hard, you know, I really love to do deep dives in the scripts with my filmmakers, right? And I think that this is uh, helpful, you know, to this uh, process. And what that is, is not just script development, right? Where you're giving notes and they're executing, you're getting the script. Particularly once you reach the point of satisfaction, maybe like you feel it's ready to go out to financiers or to cast. At that point, to really kind of do an examination together, producer and director, and I find it really helpful if there's actually more than two people, you know, often these days that's natural, but sometimes it can really even be the, the um, director's assistant or partner or an outside source, but, but examining the script for its cinematic opportunity and resonance, right? So trying to understand how we can reinforce the, the filmmaker's um, goals, both aesthetically, emotionally, thematically, um, in each of the elements that, that's there in the script. What do they mean when they say this, right? And how does the audience how do we expect the audience to feel that? Are we developing expectation? Are we tracking these elements, right? And in that dive, everyone needs to be charged with, with displaying themselves, right? I worked with a filmmaker recently um, doing this and she asked me to start each of the conversations where I would tell a personal story related to the film's goals, right? So that, you know, that's putting you on the spot. That's pretty damn personal. And you have to be able to, to perform, right? You know, so like, tell me a story about you, about this, right? And what we're doing is getting to know each other, right? Um, we, we're, we're trying to, to, to uh, expedite the reveal of what matters most to us right? Display a level of vulnerability, display, display what your hopes and dreams and longings are, and how all of this relates to the script, because it's going to be five years, you're going to have a lot of dinners together, you're going to have really tough time, one of you is going to have something go horribly wrong in their personal life, you know, uh, somebody dying, or le you know, blah, 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 and you're going to have to be able to get through it, and hopefully have it all advance your project to greater expectations. You know, it's a ton of work, right? You can't be cavalier about what that relationship is, you know, and you have to be lifting it every day or it just doesn't work. And you just say, you know what, this one's not working. So I think we're running out of time, can't really take a bit of time. I'm going to finish on one, I like it's a positive question, which is like, no matter what point any of us are in our careers, what do you think, is there anything that we can do as we go along to ensure that the industry is more inclusive and better for the next generation or, or yeah, anything that you can think of? Well, ask, ask that question on a regular basis, right? You know, um, I think that like one of the things that, that helps you have a sustainable, creative, generative life, you know, um, is while you're trying to define what the components are for all the things that you are passionate about, both uh, being cinema and different themes or ideas and what your own aesthetics and sense of, of beauty might, might, might be, you're also constantly trying to recognize all the things that, that you love and feel passionate about and where your, your community is, where the world is, where you want it all to go, both those things to, to, to go. You know, you're managing a huge amount of complexity, right? But you're also asking yourself, where is my industry and where do I want it to go? 
and uh, about seven years ago, um, I started developing the, this this process and shared, you know, on the internet, um, what was like 19 things. I called it uh, 19 things about our creative culture. I wouldn't use those words right now, but I would say really 19 thing, 19 things about the film ecosystem that might that should affect your uh, uh, creative and entrepreneurial practices. And I try to I try to make it comprehensive, right? And I just recently looked back at that list, and there was only one that I felt didn't apply anymore, like those other eighteen did. And I thought when I looked at it, there was at least three things that I overlooked that were true then. I then tried to define the the things for now, and the now one had forty, right? So, like we are being hit with this uh, avalanche. But one of the things that really made me feel like a total ass was in that 19 list, even though at that time, I was actively talking a lot in environments like this, the need to diversify our community. In that nine, list of 19 things, I didn't reinforce that. I neglected that. And I, I, I feel like an ass for, for doing that. But at the same time, um, I try to examine like, why did I, why, why did I neglect that? And some of that was like, I thought it was a cultural problem, you know, and I think some of that, my naming um, should have caught that too at the time, more than our necessarily just our business problem, but it's our business. And let's be super real about it, right? It's driving our business into the gutter by missing it, right? We, we've missed building our audiences. People say, oh, why don't people go to the movies? because they're not culturally relevant to them anymore, right? We have to be aggressive and then look at what we do as an industry. It's tokenism, it's tokenism. It's like, oh, like we, we, upped, we, we increased our diversification by X percent. Look, I recognize that it's totally hard, but the realities that have come up in this discussion too, like how do you have a sustainable life? How can you afford to make ambitiously authored films under this ecosystem, we have to just say like, we have to accelerate this in every way possible really quickly so that new producers and new filmmakers in the next one to three years can be at a, a income level that they can say, I'm going to uh, be daring and risk-taking in my career of advancing new voices uh, and advancing new ways of telling stories. And I can, and, and I and I'm entitled to dream of actually having a family, of owning property, and having a good education, and having good health care. Like, like how how can we how can we do that? I think we're taking way too casual approach to it, you know. And I understand we all have so much on our plate, you know. I have some thoughts that I'm going to do in that regard. Um, I thought I would be further along by October 23rd. Um, I would have loved to have been able to say, this is what I'm doing to all, all, all of you. Um, and, you know, maybe I'm not being ruthless enough in my prior to, prioritization of, of things. Um, I keep falling in love with new movies that I want to bring into the world. Sometimes they're not totally on my mandate and agenda. Um, and I like the, that, that fact. But um, I do think like it is saying, what is the world? Just what that question is, that's the first step. What is the world that we want? And let's not be satisfied with what we have. And let's actually make sure some of our practice is uh, advancing towards what those goals are. And I think that one of the most helpful things we can always do is get together, whether that's virtually or, or in one day again, uh, socially, to kind of share both what our experiences are, but also ideas that can be implemented, you know, because we are going to have to stumble and fail, stumble and fail. Because, you know, um, you know, when I look at, okay, what's been one of the transformative things of our, of our recent life, I see that you needed a global village 
to get to a Friendster, to get to a MySpace, to get to a Facebook, and Facebook's going to fall, and there's going to be something better, and that's also going to go down in 10 years, and there'll be something better uh, too. Um, but it's a long process, you know, and like that's just what it is. We have to iterate on a constant basis and make sure we keep our eyes towards the goals of the things that we want and don't let our own defeat, you know, jade us. Like, like I, I think that I feel like the thing that's exciting to me, like some of the stuff we talked about, I've been in it a long time. My friends have been in it a long time. Like I, you know, what I, I was talking to some of them and they are feeling the same thing that I'm feeling. Like I'm feeling like I did when I was 25 years old, like full of energy, real belief that we can get things done, that it is going to change, you know, and despite all of this horrid shit that we've had to face, we're going to get through it and we'll see something much better on the other side. I think that's an absolutely perfect place to, to, to leave it. I will say that you can follow Ted on Facebook and Twitter, and you really should pick up Hope for Film. It's brilliant. Because of some misorder of me being a complete idiot, I've got two spare copies. If genuinely anybody's struggling financially <laughs> at the moment and they want a copy of it, you can find my email on my website, email me, and no questions asked, I'll send, send you a copy of it. I've only got two spare though. So <laughs> thank you very much, Ted. Anything else you'd like to say or are you good? To no, go? just exactly like if there's more to discuss, you know, uh, find me on social media. I'm on those old guy platforms of Twitter and Facebook. Mostly I, I lurk on some other ones. Um, I haven't launched my TikTok page yet. So, uh, you know, that's, that's coming. I'm trying to learn how to dance, but Thank you very much. <laughs> Have a good weekend, everyone. Take care. All right. Bye -bye. Thanks for joining. I appreciate this opportunity.